For most of their history, the people of Romania lacked a nation-state, an Eastern Roman-speaking group. They've been isolated since the fall of the Roman Empire, and over the centuries have been dominated by their more powerful neighbours. Romania's earlier history is a story of a struggle for survival. The ferocity of one Wallachian prince, Vlad the Impaler, is even the inspiration for Dracula. But with the rise of nationalism across Europe in the mid-19th century, the Romanians seized their chance to come together. Exactly how, then, did they actually do it? What stood in Romania's way? And why did the country eventually have not one, but two unifications? Well, for centuries, Romania, centred around the principalities of Wallachia, Moldavia, and Transylvania, served as a borderland and a battlefield for the often at war Russian and Ottoman empires. At their height, the Ottomans controlled all three, but by the 1830s, when Romanian political unification, or at least its first stage, began, the Romanian lands were split between empires. Wallachia and parts of Moldavia were nominally subordinate to the Sublime Port, the Ottoman central government, but were in practice made Russian protectorates by the Treaty of Adrianople in 1829. The rest of Moldavia, the regions of Bessarabia and Bukovina, had already been conquered by Russia and Habsburg Austria. Transylvania by then formed a part of the Habsburgs' Kingdom of Hungary. The process of unification would begin when Russia created parallel, but still separate, institutions in Wallachia and Moldavia. Collectively, they're called the Organic Statute Governments. The Organic Statutes empowered a small number of Boyer families, the Romanian aristocracy, and a prince, but most Romanians were left entirely out of politics, something that annoyed everyone, but particularly the educated, professional, and growing middle class, who openly embraced new liberal and nationalistic ideas, and would lead efforts for Romanian unity. Not that they wanted majority rule, mind you, the unsophisticated peasantry could of course never be allowed near the levers of power, but certainly they dreamed of a more meritocratic style of government than rule by hereditary nobility. The year 1848 saw liberals rise up to fight for their ideas across Europe, and each of Romania's principalities participated in the revolutions, with limited success. Moldavia is hardly worth mentioning. The conservative aristocracy, aided by Russia, put down the rebels in no time at all. However, they were partially led by a man named Alexandru Ion Cusa. In Transylvania, ethnic Romanians were distracted fighting against Hungarian revolutionary nationalists, but in Wallachia, rebels managed to take over the capital, Bucharest. Their provisional government lasted for three months, and was both anti-Russian and anti-Ottoman. It wanted to unite Wallachia and Moldavia, and choose a foreign noble as their prince to gain an alliance along with him. They were stymied, as Wallachians could count on no help from ethnic Romanians elsewhere, and even among the revolutionaries there were deep divisions. Critically, they failed to win support from the peasantry, to whom the liberals seemed to be just another elite class vying for power, if a slightly bigger one. The revolutionaries' failure also made it crystal clear that Romanian unification simply couldn't be achieved by standing alone against their imperial neighbours. Conveniently then, those neighbours continued their long tradition of not getting along, and in 1853 the Ottomans and the Russian Empire again went to war. The Romanian principalities were quickly occupied, but this time the Turks were backed by Britain and France, the Crimean War went in the Allies' favour, and the 1856 Treaty of Paris decreed that the organic statute governments would go. With their being subject to the Ottomans only a legal fiction, Wallachia and Moldavia were now functionally independent. They also got access to the sea. Whether they could unite was another matter. The powers were split over the issue, and with gridlock in Paris, so-called divans ad hoc gathered in both Moldavia and Wallachia. Under Ottoman pressure, they voted for the status quo. Then, under French pressure, they voted for union, but ultimately both were ignored, and in 1858 the powers met again in Paris and eventually agreed on the August Convention. Like under the Organic Statutes, the August Convention sought to maintain two separate governments in Moldavia and Wallachia. They would keep two assemblies, have two cabinets of ministers, and each was to choose a different prince, but unlike before, they would also have a limited central commission, a sort of executive, and a court system. 
That didn't really satisfy 48ers, though, the liberal revolutionaries, but they managed to get around the spirit, if not the letter, of the convention. Rather than a foreigner, they chose one of them, Alexandro Cusa, as prince in Wallachia in late 1858, and then to some powers' chagrin, also for Moldavia in January 1859. As the United Principalities, Wallachia and Moldavia were under one ruler, and after Cusa officially abolished his two separate governments and centralized the state in 1862, Romania's first unification was complete. Getting to the second still would take some work. Both Cusa's fellow liberal nationalistic 48ers and the conservative landed classes, in spite of their original opposition, backed political unification. Frankly, it just made things simpler, but it was also one of the last times that they would agree on anything. Two problems plagued Cusa's reign, the extent of the franchise and agrarian reform. At that point, almost all Romanians were poor peasants working on estates. For the liberals, reform was a matter of efficiency and social progress. Parts of Romania still looked feudal in a quickly industrializing Europe. For the conservatives, it was about balancing maintenance of their status while also avoiding all-out peasant revolution. Cusa handled both problems poorly. He started off well enough appointing a liberal prime minister who secularized lands held tax-free by the Orthodox Church, and expanded voting rights for smaller landowners and middle-class professionals. But the 1864 agrarian law, while radical on paper, was effectively unenforceable outside of the capital. Boyers were formally stripped of their noble rights, but stayed incredibly powerful, Land redistribution favoured them heavily, and Romania functionally remained a country of landed estates. Cusa's situation went further downhill when his own allies, the Liberals, began to turn against the prince as his reign progressed. He was only ever a compromise candidate in the first place, and the obvious failure of land reform seemed to prove his inadequacy. He fell out with his government over its implementation, and of course the Conservatives had never liked him at all. That culminated in both them and the Liberals coming together, along with the army, in 1866 to depose Alexandru Cusa. In his place, the 48ers finally got what they wanted. To secure relations with a Western power, Romania chose Karl of Hohenzollern Sigmaringen to be its new prince. He came with the benefit of associating Romania with Germany, being distantly related to the soon-to-be Kaiser, and he also had the stamp of approval of France's Napoleon III. Not that that mattered much after his own deposition. The other great powers accepted the installation of Karl, who took the Romanian regnal name Carol I as a fait accompli, while the Austro-Prussian War distracted their attention. Carol's reign was much more successful than that of Cusa. As a condition of his election, he agreed to a constitution that vested most power in the Romanian assembly. He also embraced Romanian culture, quickly learning the language and promising to raise his family in the Romanian Orthodox Church, all of which won him genuine popularity. It did not unite the political classes, and with land reform seemingly too difficult to approach, Romanian governments under Carol I focused on foreign policy. He personally despised being a subject of the Ottoman Sultan, even if only nominally, and began to guide Romania towards total independence. His government won recognition from Russia and Austria-Hungary in the 1870s, and entered into commercial agreements with both. But as with so many things in Romania, it would take yet another Russo-Turkish war to finally break its bond to the sublime port. And that came about in early 1877, and Romania joined the Russian army in attacking the Ottoman Balkans. Shortly afterwards, it declared independence. Russia crushed the Ottomans, and it was only with the diplomatic intervention of the other great powers that they were spared from being pushed out of Europe. The Treaty of Berlin recognized Romania as a fully independent state, and three years later, Carol I was crowned King of Romania in line with that new status. But the end of the war left Romanians disgruntled. Russia had permitted them less land than they sought, and in fact the Bessarabian territory ceded by Russia to Moldavia in 1856 was taken back. The country was independent, but millions of ethnic Romanians still remained outside of Romania, and given that they were ruled by the new kingdom's only real allies, there wasn't much that could be done about that. 
For the next 30 years, the cause of Romanian unification was relegated to sword-rattling with Bulgaria, which had received Southern Dobruja after the 1878 war over Romania's objections. Bessarabia, Bukovina, and Transylvania were simply beyond their reach. That was until the Balkan crises and the shattering of Europe's balance of power in 1914. Romania had mixed success in World War I, despite having secretly agreed to align with the Triple Alliance of Italy, Germany, and Austria-Hungary before it broke out, it remained neutral at the war's start. When it did eventually join both the elected government and the new king, Carol's nephew Ferdinand I, aligned with the Entente. Hoping to acquire Transylvania, Romanian forces invaded Austria-Hungary in August 1916, only to find two-thirds of their own country occupied by the end of the year. Then, when the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar in 1917, Romania found itself allyless and in a dire situation. That did, at long last, see the return of Bessarabia, though, when, with the Romanian military present, revolutionaries there proclaimed the creation of the Moldavian Democratic Republic, which promptly voted to unite with Romania proper. Still, without the Russians, Romania stood no chance against the combined forces of Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Bulgaria, so they agreed to peace in 1918. The effects of that would not last long. As the Germans faltered on the Western Front and Austria-Hungary began to disintegrate under the weight of its many disparate ethnicities, Romania rejoined the war against them on November 10, 1918, a day before it ended. At the Versailles Peace Conference, Romania's losses were reversed, and they set their sights on their long-lost third principality of Transylvania. So, when Hungary officially terminated its union with Austria and fell into a period of near-total chaos, Romania invaded and pushed all the way to Budapest. That victory, and the support of the Entente, particularly France, resulted in the post-war treaties of Trianon and Saint-Germain-en-Laye. Those saw millions of ethnic Romanians united with their mother country. Of course, Romania would only keep those precise borders for another 20 years until World War II again redrew the map of Europe. The Romanian-speaking world is now divided between Romania and the former Soviet Republic, Moldova. It also wasn't the case that everyone in the new lands was happy to be Romanian. Large minorities of Hungarians and Germans inhabited Transylvania in particular. You can find out more about them in the video on the Treaty of Trianon to the left, or find out how another Romance nation, Italy, united a generation earlier. As always, I've been James, and I'll see you there.